recording. This meeting is being recorded. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's session of the Virtual Global Spine Conference. It's a great honor that uh, we have today two guests from Europe, two guests from Norway. It's um, uh, two famous guests, um, Dr. Ivor Austerfall from the University Hospital in Bergen. He's an orthopedic surgeon and he's uh, the first author of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, published last year in 2021. Um, we all know this um, paper, Decompression versus Decompression Infusion in the Degen Spondylistasis. And Dr. Clemens Weber, he is also an author from this paper. He's a neurosurgeon from the University Hospital in Skavanger. Um, I, um, today's topic is very clear. We are talking about this RCT and uh, Dr. Osterfall will tell us many details um, about the topic and the RCT and then later we see, we see all the, um, in some, some cases um, and uh, we will discuss this uh, epic uh, topic. Um, I was taught um, to fuse any listeses when I started in orthopedic uh, like 15, 16 years ago. Uh, today, <laughs> it's controversial more than ever. And thank you very much. Um, it's 11 o'clock in Norway. Thank you, Dr. Austerfeld. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for joining us. And we are very honored that you uh, can present these um, uh, cases and your study. Dr. Austerfeld, <clears throat> when I uh, may ask you to start. Thank you. So can you can you see my uh, my picture? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. It's so and thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. As you said, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon from Haukeland University Hospital in Bergen, the second largest city in Norway. Since uh, 2005, I have solely kept on with spine surgery. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and. I'm looking forward to this um, virtual conference of how to treat this large patient group. My theoretical background is from the work with my PhD and several, several studies related to this. So we're talking about how to operate spinal stenosis with degenerative listeases. First, I will give you a, a narrative of a worldwide treatment shift. The original surgical therapy was a standard lam laminectomy and fusion of the laminectomy were considered unnecessary. But from the 1990s, fusion became increasingly common and became rapidly the golden standard. Data from the Norwegian Registry of Spine Surgery shows that in the period from 2007 to 2010, 75% of the operative patient received a fusion procedure. In my hospital, at, at least 80% of the patients were operated with fusion. And from my lecture at that time, the standard take home message was always fuse spinal stenosis if a concomitant orthostasis was or is obtained. In the United States, instrument diffusion became increasingly more common. And as shown in this video, less than 5% were in 2011 operated with decompression alone. The fusion rate in the United States more than doubled from 2005 to 14. And degenerative spondylolisthesis accounted for the most fusion. The US aggregated hospital costs were in 2015 estimated to $4 billion. 
So what was the evidence for the shift? I will now present the three most influential papers contributing, contributing to this shift. It seems to start in the 1991 with a well-known paper from Herkowitz and Kutz. They compared laminectomy alone with laminectomy plus instrument, uninstrumented fusion in a pseudo-randomized trial of 15 patients. At follow-up, after, after mean three years, they found more relief in leg and back pain if bone grafting was performed. This is the most cited DS paper. Then, in 1997, a randomized trial by Fischgren et al. compared laminectomy plus uninstrumented fusion with laminectomy plus instrumented fusion, also with Herkowitz and Kurtz among the authors. At two-year follow-up, 85% in the bone graft group and 76 in the instrumentation group reported the outcome to be good or excellent and non-significant difference. A successful fusion was more often obtained in the instrumentation group. So until 1997, no evidence exists regarding clinical outcomes for using screws and rods. But additional bone graft, according to the Herkowitz study, better than laminectomy. But no additional benefit of additional instrumentation. This is the second most cited paper. The next influential study was the, I call it the game changing study of Kornblum, published in 2004, with Herkowitz and Fischgren still on the author list. In this study, they inve investigate the long term follow up in patients included in the two before mentioned studies. But, and important to recognize, recognize only patients operated with laminectomy because in instru uninstrumented fusion were followed. So they compa compared those with a successful fusion and those with cerebral atrocities. After an average of about eight years postoperative, they demonstrated benefits of a successful radiologi radiological fusion compared to those with cerebral atrocities with respect to leg and back pain. So they concluded that the addition of spinal instrumentation increases the ability to obtain a solid fusion and may be recommended, recommended as an adjunct to bone grafting alone. So the, this evidence trial, uninstrumented fusion gave less pain, according to Harkovic. Instrumented fusion gave less cerebral trosis. And at long time, less cerebral trosis gave less leg and back pain. However, the design of the last study was argued against by Jeffrey Katz in the same issue of, of spine. He stated that the authors Conclusion was speculative. Instead of only following patients operated with one method and comparing the radiological worst versus the best, they should co compare the ori original treatment arms. Was it all the reasons to the shift? Yes. Based on these three studies and other low sample retrospective cohort studies, several meta analyses, reviews, and guidelines have been published. The blues in this, um, on this slide recommended fusion, 
the reds found no difference between the between fusion and decompression alone, and the blacks concluded insufficient evidence. I don't know whether it reached statistically significant, but the nationality of the authors shows at least at least a trend. And some influential and skeptical authors as Karagi and Deo have suggested that financial incentives, incentives contributed to the shift. The evidential problem was that until 2016, no high quality OCTs existed. Then the well-known trials from Gogavala and First were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I will comment these trials when presenting, presenting or Northern DS trial. I know I will give you a short presentation of about five minutes of this trial. And none of the authors have uh, any conflicts of interest. And uh, the background, as you know, degenerative spondylolisthesis is a condition in which one vertebra has it forward in relation to the vertebra below. Patients typically suffer from leg and back pain due to a concomitant spinal stenosis. There are two main surgical approaches, decompression alone and decompression with instrument diffusion. However, the evidence for the drug the best treatment option has been inconsistent. Two previous trials found conflicting results. One concluded that decompression was enough and one recommended fusion. In this Northern DS trial, we aim to investigate whether decompression alone was non-inferior to decompression with instrumented fusion. We included patients with symptomatic and MRI verified spinal stenosis who had a slip of at least three millimeter on standing x-ray. Patients were included regardless of the degree of listesis and of dynamic instability. We excluded patients with scoliosis radicular pain due to an extensive foraminal stenosis, previous surgery at the level of listesis, or spondylolisthesis in more than one level. The patients were then randomized. For the decompression group, a posterior decompression preserving the midline structures was mandatory. For the fusion group, decompression was followed by pedicle screw instrumentation and bone grafting with optional use of an intervertebral fusion device. A microscope or magnifying glasses was mandatory in both treatment groups during decompression. The patients were followed for two years. The primary endpoint, endpoint was an improvement of at least 30% on the Osvastri Disability Index, defined as a successful outcome. Secondary outcomes included mean UDI, the Zurich clavication questionnaire, leg and back pain, reoperation within two years, and duration of surgery and hospital stay. Results. 267 patients from 16 departments in Norway were enrolled and randomized. 91% had data at two year follow -up. This figure, shows the difference in successful outcomes measured in percentage points. And to recap, a successful outcome was defined as a 30% improvement on the UDI. A difference to left of zero indicate more patients with a successful outcome in the decompression group to the right higher success rate in the fusion group. The non-inferiority margin was predefined to 50 percentage points. In the intention to treat analyzer, 71.4 in the decompression group and 72.9 in the fusion group had a successful outcome, a difference of 
percentage point. The respective difference in the per protocol analysis was 0%. For both analyses, the confid confidence interval was below the margin of non-inferiority. Neither were there any differences between the groups in the mean improvement of the UDI, the Zurich claudication scores, and no differences in leg pain or back pain. The reoperation rate was not statistically significant difference. The ratio of surgery and hospital stay was shorter in the decompression group. Discussion. Compared with previously published RCTs, all recent results were similar to the one of the trials, showing no clinical advantages of fusion and no significant differences in reoperation rate. All three studies show significantly longer duration of surgery and hospital stay when fusion was performed. The trial had, has limitations. It was an open label trial. Only the data analyst was blinded for treatment allocation. And finally, important to recognize, the results cannot be generalized to the excluded groups of patients. So in this trial invol involving patients operated for spinal stenosis with degenerative polycystitis, decompression was non-inferior or not worse than decompression with instrumented fusion after two years. Further details are shown in the published paper. So what mentioned is that uh, among included patients, 20% had a dynamic instability and some more than 20% had a slip. Now some more than uh, 36 patients had a slip more than 20%. The paper has been read worldwide about four 40% of them from the US, United States, more than 10% from the Asia, but remarkably few rates, relative rates from the north of Europe outside Norway. The paper has also thoroughly com been commented on. And uh, maybe surprisingly, the trial has nearby not at all been argued against or been criticized. Finally, I should, will show you the trends the last year from Norway. We have seen a dramatically shift following the published register, following the published register studies during the last 10 years. Interestingly and fortunately, the outcomes assessed by the ODI have not changed during the same period. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arsenal, for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, overview of, of your study. Um, now, now we have twenty twenty two. When did you start as a group to uh, to set up this study? How many years ago uh, did you um, guys come together and say, "Let's make an RCT"? Uh, we uh, started talking about it. Uh, I think it was about 2000 and the, the end of 2010. And I, I was uh, asked by the, by the New England to, to send the first protocol. And that was from 2011. Yeah. And, and we, um, started, we started to include patients uh, in uh, 2014, at the start of 2014. In 40. So you did some four years um, of, of planning um, and creating the, the funding and everything like this. And they said, do, do you think, um, because you, I, I guess you are the, one of the scientists, uh, the researchers who spent most um, uh, of your of the time to, to go into the depth of history of spine surgery. And I, I think you crawled the papers back like 30 or 40 years. Why? Was there no 
other RCT before. Uh, why is this so late when we compare to, to different um, other uh, conditions? Why um, do we have these RCTs first in 2021? Um, can you um, describe what are the obstacles? What are, your, what are the, the difficult things to, um, to set up um, such a study? Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the time, uh, um, about uh, 2000, 2010, 2000, uh, 2011, we started, I definitely thought that we need uh, fusion and that this question was led. So, uh, but in Norway, we, we, we still uh, discussed, uh, especially with the neurosurgeon that, that did not uh, fuse those, these patients. So uh, <laughs> at the beginning, we, uh, we thought, we, let's, let's make a trial to, to definitely question this, uh, answer this question. Yes. Yeah, I think it's the same. Like um, I started in neurosurgery um, and in the in the clinic, in the department of neurosurgery, there were, this is 20 years ago, there were not many surgeons able to perform a fusion. This is like two decades ago. Then I switched to orthopedic surgeon and every spine surgeon was able to, um, to perform instrumentation because of the trauma load and everything like this. And um, it is funny because really, like 15 years ago, um, my teacher told us to fuse any listesis and instrument mm. any listesis. So in Switzerland, uninstrumented fusion was left like um, 80, 20 years ago. Um, uh, did you first have bad feelings when you did, you on your own, did your decompression only after you were taught to fuse every listesis did you feel insecure by yourself uh, no but that that's because we at the same time started to look at the results from the from our national registry and uh, we were surprised when we recognized that the difference we we there did not find any difference between the groups. But uh, from there to say that the same results will, uh, will, um, will co should come in the OCT, uh, we were not sure about that. But we, have, we had, uh, we had uh, some signals that, that uh, maybe, the, maybe the, the treatments are, are, are different. So yeah. uh, we, we, we told the patients it, it may, might be that the fusion uh, gives some better result, but it's less dangerous. It's, um, it's uh, more rapid. Um, you, you, you will um, more rapidly come, come back to the normal uh, daily living with uh, your activities without fusion. So it was not, um, I find it no, not difficult to, to explain the, the, um, the treatment arms, the treatment alternatives for the patient. Yeah. And um, another question uh, from the chat box is, um, do you have difficulties to define symptomatic foraminal stenosis? Or did you just take the MRIs, the parasecretal views, and um, looked whether the uh, nerve root, uh, the, the exiting foramen is narrow? Um, what is an symptomatic foraminal stenosis for you? Oh, uh, it's, a difficult, uh, it's, it's a difficult question. And uh, uh, the exclusion criteria was primarily based on the MRI. So uh, we described the, the, uh, the 
Lee grade three, also a uh, um, deformed uh, nerve root uh, <laughs> in the cranial direction to be, they, those patients should be excluded. Yeah. And do, do you think an, an interbody cage makes a difference? Um, do you have subgroup analyzers where you um, compared posterolateral lateral only versus interbody fusion device? We have done. Uh, we have performed a subgroup analysis uh, uh, to see whether whether uh, treatment effect modifiers exist for choosing one treatment over the others. But uh, we have not included, um, we have not included um, T lif versus um, PLF in, in uh, that study. So we have not seen on that yet. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Osterwald. So I really loved the uh, the introduction with these landmark papers from uh, Herkowitz. Um, uh, you mentioned Deo, um, the, the the great name Deo, who who warned um, that there is a bias from the industry, financial interests from the hospitals. Um, when I look to the screen now, and you say rate of fusion procedures with fusion, um, what are the companies um, in, in Norway? Are they unlucky? Do they um, raise the, the prices of the instruments? Is there uh, any reaction of the industry? Uh, no. Uh, they are, uh, they are um, kind people. So uh, we have been with friends before and are still friends. And, uh, so they don't uh, left it, Norway. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't. And uh, what's also interesting is that everything in Norway is more expensive than, than in uh, most other countries in Europe and uh, in the US. But the prices for the instrumentation, the, for the screws and rods, are maybe the, the less expensive in the world. Okay, yeah, I, I know there are many differences in, in Europe, like in France, um, there is um, the, the, the government um, is defining the price of the, um, of the implants. In Switzerland, it's uh, capitalism um, uh, <coughs> in its finest. Um, thank you, Dr. Austerfall, for, for, presentation, for this presentation. Um, I um, would love to um, uh, give, uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Weber. Uh, he's the neurosurgeon um, in this talk to, today um, to present his um, screen. Uh, Dr. Weber, can, can you share your screen now? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, yes, let's see. Yes, perfect. We see, see it. it. Yes, very good. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Clemens. I'm uh, I'm German, but I work in Norway. I've been here for 12 years now, and um, neurosurgeon doing mostly spine surgery. And um, my background is is a PhD on on imaging, on spinal imaging, where we try to correlate different clinical and radiological findings and surprisingly in many, many cases, um, the, the, the clinical symptoms do not always uh, agree with the radiological findings, especially in spinal stenosis. And um, so I came into this study, I think I saw the first protocol when you send it around Eva, uh, in 2011 or 12, I think our de department, I was in Trondheim at that time, was also asked to participate. Um, so, uh, but I, I came later into the research group. I think that was in 16 or 17. One comment to the foramen stenosis. I remember when we started with this radiological uh, group that uh, I think it was you, Eva, who commented once, you just have to look long enough, you will always see the foramen stenosis. And I think that's uh, 
that's uh, that's true. So um, <clears throat> let's see. My disclosure: I don't have any conflicts of interest regarding to this study. Uh, no company affiliations. I've never received a euro or a dollar or anything from any implant company. Um, I'm a surgeon who likes to operate, but I'm also a researcher who likes to publish. I work in Norway, which is a country with the more conservative approach, but started my training in Germany, which is the opposite of conservative. And um, I think the most important thing here is that I have only a few selected cases in this presentation. Eva has shown us the numbers and, and I will show you a few pictures. And of course they are selected by us and uh, not by an independent unbiased uh, committee. <clears throat> so I found this tweet from 2018 from our host. And in 2018, he declared, I still fuse. I think you changed your mind, uh, Alex. Um, you don't fuse 100% anymore, at least. And that no, was no. <laughs> that You're was absolutely after, right. That, that was after the Swedish trial. Um, this is a graph from Sweden. It's, it's similar to, to Norway. Um, they started with uh, registry studies a few years before us and um, already there they started with their shift and in, uh, in 2016 the, the first study came out and um, the numbers are still quite stable. Um, <clears throat> so this summer I asked one year after our study was published, I asked on Twitter, um, if the our paper influenced your standard treatment recommendation for spondylal dysthesis. And 50% um, still prefer decompression and fusion, regardless of the evidence that is existing now. So um, I asked a new question now. If you didn't know, I, I think that was yesterday. And um, because 50% are still fusing, I asked now, what is your main reason or indication for fusion, if you still do that? And 62% um, fuse to stabilize an instability. You had a very nice comment on that, Alex. The definition of instability is very, yeah difficult. There is no good definition in my opinion and uh, I think many spine surgeons can agree on that at, at least in degenerative conditions and um, my question is if you if you want to stabilize an instability do you increase the clinical outcome or, or improve the clinical outcome why do so many patients without fusion improve as well? That is surprising for me. Um, but I want, I want to show you some cases. Um, so this is a lady, 73 years old. Uh, she has, I think, some hypertension, but otherwise she's healthy. Um, she has more leg pain than back pain and um, claudication as well. We see the MRI, <clears throat> you see the, the sagittal images, there's a uh, slip between L4 and L5, and you see the axial images with the facet joints. Uh, do you have any comments on, on the facet joints here? I think there was one comment in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, does anybody wants, wants to say anything about that here? Any comments on yeah. the facet joints? So Clemens, I take I take over um, to to command it. It is a really a tiny effusion in the facet. It's not a huge gap. I've seen a lot of um, larger gaps, 
Um, we can clearly see the listesis even in lying position in the MRI. This is not a positional X-ray. It's not an, uh, a sitting X. Uh, um, sorry, a sitting MRI. She, uh, the patient is um, uh, on the table in the MRI, and we see a, a slight um, effusion. So this is not severely, um, <clears throat> not a really impressive. I guess the uh, standing X-ray shows the same amount of slip. Maybe okay. <laughs> so this is the same. Um, will not show a major instability like more slip, more kyphosis. Um, usually we sit uh, in front of the MRI and scroll and scroll and scroll down. You showed as one single axial uh, MRI. Um, and um, you're a believer in flex X um, imaging. Um, yes. Is it standard? For the study, it was standard, yeah. We, we performed it in every patient for the study. In my daily routine, uh, when I see an MRI like that, and the patient is more leg pain than, than back pain, I usually don't do, do X-flex imaging. I don't see one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I uh, will show you more. So this is this is the patient's um, uh, prompts. She had an ODI of 33. Uh, leg pain, 6 out of 10. Back pain, 7 out of 10. Um, and uh, she was randomized to decompression alone. So this is um, a patient from the study, from the RCT. This is a patient from the study. So we are uh, looking to the source of the uh, of the RCT. This yeah. is a proof that you really treated patients with a spondy, with a spinal stenosis. Um, and, and, and you have got 263 patients included and all received an MRI and flex X imaging. We have all images. We have, we have looked into all images as well. And uh, there, there are several sub-projects going on um, looking into image findings here. And um, you will hear more about it in the future. Um, okay. So this is uh, the, the follow-up that was from, uh, she was treated in Stavanger. She was operated of one of my orthopedic colleagues here. And um, so at the three months, uh, outpatient follow-up, she was, uh, she had no leg pain, no back pain. Um, the same after two years, that was the, the notes in the patient journal. And uh, these are the prompts two years after surgery. Um, so I don't know if everybody is, is familiar with the GPE, the Global Perceived Effective uh, Score. Um, so a score, of, it's from one to five, isn't it, Eva? Yeah. One to five, I think, and one is it's, is, uh, it's a Likert scale with seven, um, seven. Uh, uh, from uh, completely recovered is um, is one uh, much better as two, somewhat better is um, is uh, uh, three, and yeah. a seven is worse than uh, worse than ever. Yeah. So, so one or two is. This is, I, I looked up these patients yesterday. Uh, and um, so this is now uh, very unofficial. <laughs> this is the five years follow-up x-ray, which I found in the system that she did this summer. Uh, she hasn't been there for any follow-up yet, so I don't have any clinical data, uh, but she hasn't been referred yet. Uh, to any follow-up. So in Norway, we have like a regional referral system. Um, so patients that are living in Stavanger are referred to the hospital in Stavanger. There is no other department or hospital or clinic. The next one would be in Bergen, which is two and a half hours away. So 90%, uh, over 90% of the patients in Norway are treated at their regional hospital. So if she would have had any complaints now, she probably would have been referred back to us, but I couldn't see any referral. Um, this was the, the five years follow-up X-ray from this summer. And I think the, we, we see the images that uh, 
the slip didn't increase uh, much. So we don't have any jetrogranic uh, increase of, of the listhesis. Um, and uh, in, in the x-ray uh, referral, it just said that she had no pain. Um, but five years results will come. Um, <clears throat> so again, back to the 62% that want to stabilize an instability. Did this patient have an instability? Yes or no? And was it necessary to stabilize her or not? Um, so if you have any comments on that. Um... Yeah, I think uh, you, you know my, my um, answer <laughs> um, um, because um, this is the perfect um, case you've showed and now um, where I don't perform fusion anymore. I did 10 years ago, um, but then with the Swedish um, uh, studies, um, uh, you, you mentioned my tweet from 2018. Um, and now it's, it's hard for me to convince um, a patient to undergo fusion surgery when he asks me, is this necessary? I'm afraid of uh, screws, I'm afraid of fusion. Do I really need to, to get this um, metal in, in my body? And now, um, now I have very good data and uh, to tell, um, no, you don't have to. Um, but the exclusion, the exclusion criteria that Ivor Ostafol has mentioned in his part are so important here yeah, because I will, I will definitely um, uh, do something different if there is a severe foraminal stenosis. I will definitely consider fusion when the gaps in the joints are really huge and uh, the X-ray shows uh, a, a amount of kyphosis, everything like this. Um, but I don't know what an instability is. This is um, something I, I have to mention here. Um, and I don't know whether a degen spondylolisthesis is a radiological or um, a radiological finding or is it a disease? I cannot tell you. There's this, um, I will describe it. It's a morphologic thing, but whether it's a disease to be treated or whether it's a radiological finding to, 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 to document, but somehow to ignore, uh, I'm not smart enough to answer this question. I'm looking have, forward to see case yeah. two. I, I, I this... think no one is uh, has um, is able to to say what instability is. It's it's never no evidence of this um, uh, construct. Surprisingly, yeah, you are absolutely right, Ivor. But I have the, my teachers in my ear still. And they mentioned every day on the round, uh, this is a listesis, it's an instability. They, they were smart, they were good surgeons and they have had excellent results, not better than if they had de decompressed only, but they were really smart people and pioneers in spine surgery. And they declared a listesis as an instability. And this is where we are coming from like 20 years ago. Um, this was our world. Um, a listesis is an instability. Uh, that needs to be fused. Okay, I have more cases. Um, this is the next one. It's a lady, 58 years old. She's still working in, I think she was a nurse. And um, which some say might be a contraindication, but whatever. Um, she had more than three years of, uh, of leg pain and some back pain as well and uh, also claudication. And we have the MRIs here. Um, the facet joints look similar, yeah, or maybe a bit better than the first one. Um, the spinal canal, <clears throat> it's quite similar, but we see redundant nerve roots here, which might be important in the future. We will see. And um, this is the, her pre-op, uh, the pre-op scores. Um, she had quite significant back pain as well with a score of seven. And these are the, the x-rays. And um, I think we can agree that there's not very much movement either between extension and flexion. 
and um, she was operated with decompression alone. And also here we see a very good result after two years. Um, I don't want to mention the surgeon. Um, and um, she was uh, she was very happy. And uh, I, I haven't found any five years images here, but um, she will come in yeah, this winter probably. Um, <clears throat> this was also quite clear case. Um, no, sorry, this was the five years image. Yeah. Um, so we have a five years image here and that might indicate an increasing slip here, a few millimeters, but she hasn't been referred yet. So, so we will see. I don't have any clinical uh, information on her. Clemens, may I ask you a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the patients for sure received epidural steroid injections before surgery, don't they? Not in the, in the study, huh? It's, okay. it's not available in Norway. Are you doing that in, in, in? Yeah, yeah, we do injections like like hell. So like they they need they get like ten uh, shots uh, before surgery here. Yeah. I think there are a few private institutions performing it, but I think in public healthcare, do you know anyone, Ivar? We do it only for diagnostic reasons. If there's like a multi-segmental stenosis and and the patient has a monoradiculopathy, then we do it for for diagnostic reasons, but but not as a treatment option usually. No, I don't think, uh, think it's um, available in um, the public hospitals in Norway. Conservative yeah, so treatment is, is physical therapy, pain medication. That's what, what is available. Oh, this is great news. Thank you. Um, third case. This is a male patient. He was 79 years old. This one is a little bit more tricky, I think. He uh, was sicker than the others. Um, he had hypertension, angina, cancer disease, uh, ASA3. And um, if you look at the images, it's not that clear anymore. We see uh, the slip between four and five, but, but the rest of the spine doesn't really look very good either. Um, <clears throat> The facet joints, there's some edema. It's not a big gap, but yeah, the canal is, is pretty tight as well. Um, any comments on that? Is it a good patient for an RCT? If it's a prostate cancer, it's not an exclusion criterion. Um, it, is, um, it is really common because many men with the seven, 70, 80 years have got prostate cancer in any kind of uh, stage. If it's not, um, uh, um, I, I think, yes, you can, you can take him into the RCT if they are in both arms um, uh, and the randomization is good. Um, uh, they, they can be included. ASO3 is my, my average patient is ASO3. <laughs> I think a cancer diagnosis is an, is an exclusion criteria in very many RCTs within orthopedics and, and, and neurosurgery. So, but, but he was included. It was not an exclusion uh, criteria here. Um, but he was, yeah, he was sicker than the others and he had more pain. Um, so, oh, sorry, this is his pre-op scores, uh, eight and eight and 40. Um, the, the images, maybe a slight increase uh, between extension and flexion. Um, the spine is more degenerative. This is a page, patient who was operated also by an orthopedic surgeon uh, without an interbody cage. Um, I read the, the uh, OR report, the operation report. And uh, it says that it was too difficult to get into the, the, the disc space. You see, it's quite narrow. Um, but you get a lot of bone crafting and uh, surgery went, went fine. Um, <clears throat> any comments on the AP image, maybe? Anything to see there? 
it's a it's a huge patient, isn't isn't he? Because the yeah. the implants seem to be a little bit tiny, but I guess these are six millimeters, and the the, the vertebral bodies are huge. Um, I, I we, we did many of posterior lateral um, uh, surgery fusion surgeries um, a decade ago because our boss was not convinced about the the necessity uh, of interbody that time. Um, I, I think um, when Mike Saudi can join in, he he would miss the um, the a lift cage um, <laughs> for sure. Um, it is is so hard to um, to make comment on 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 the technique because we know in every country it's performed a little bit different. The history, the the teaching, the philosophy um, is different. Um, mm. But I think posterolateral fusion in the older in the elder patient are sometimes very wise not to um, go for the cage um, because it's a lot um, more bleeding. It's uh, more difficult. Um, and it's, um, it makes a reason to, uh, to not uh, place the cage sometimes. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the AP images, pre-op, post-op, and after two years. So, um... Clemens, uh, can I uh, jump in and ask a question based on all that? Yeah, and, and Ivar, look, what I'm, did you guys do any subgroup analyses on disc height and progression? Because, you know, this case here obviously has really low disc height um, and, um, you know, to start with, right? And, uh, you know, I saw the, the pre-MRI. I mean, I would have, you know, I know this patient is a trial patient, right? But I would have clinically led towards decompression alone in this patient. Uh, a lot, um, mm. put people through a lot of tests. I do a lot of blocks to work out what's better for these cases. But, you know, to me, um, that sort of history, as well as the age um, and the collapse of disc is leaning towards, you know, um, the uh, decompression clinically for me. Now, in the trial setting, I very much understand why this patient got got randomized, didn't they, to a, um, a postrolateral fusion. But, you know, this is a sort of, the problem I have with generalized RCTs is that this patient to me is not the same as one with a big disc height. Hmm. Do you know so what I mean? I, 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 uh, I totally agree. When, when, I, when this patient wouldn't have been in the RCT, I would recommend it decompression alone. Definitely. Yeah, me too. Uh, the yeah. age, 79 years old, with, uh, with his ASA3 and, and his, his uh, medical history, I would definitely just have chosen a decompression. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, Eva showed me some, some uh, interesting slides yesterday. Um, when we saw the patients at the outpatient clinic the first time and included the patient into the trial, uh, the surgeon was asked if he would recommend decompression alone or decompression and fusion. For this specific patient and before uh, randomization before randomization yeah. so and then the patient got randomized and was operated a few weeks or a month later so um it's very interesting to see that uh yeah eva maybe you can comment on that i, I don't know do you have a slide on that you had a slide on that yesterday You're muted, Eva. Okay, I can show you. Uh, I try to find that one. Um, give me one second. May I just, um, Clemens, it's so, so important that we are all biased in our outpatient clinics. Um, and this is so interesting. Uh, what um, sometimes my boss told me there's a patient you have to fuse him and I thought well maybe it's not uh, the ideal candidate for a fusion this is an emotionally impacted decision um, and you in your in your RCT had to perform I guess some surgeries where you would recommend the opposite um, if the patient was not in the RCT so interesting I, I don't think if, I wouldn't say the opposite, 
it's an adjunct, it's an addition, right? So the, 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 the decompression was always the same. So that was always a, a microsurgical decompression. That was, that was the same uh, for all patients. The additional thing with the fusion, <clears throat> that was, was uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, that's another story, definitely. Um, but we all like to fuse, definitely. So <laughs> everywhere, there's nothing like a good screw. So, uh, so uh, we all, we all, I'm a neurosurgeon, but I still like to put in screws, of course. But um, I think um, it, it was interesting that we had this question at the at the inclusion uh, visit. Um, what would you What would you recommend for the patient? And then we had quite a few patients that were recommended or, or randomized to the other treatment arm. And um, I don't know, do you find the slide, Eva? Or should I just go on with the cases? I can, uh, I can at least uh, tell you the results. Uh, we, uh, we looked at, uh, uh, we compa compared uh, cases where, the, where it was agreement between the surgeon and the randomization with those without agreement, and um, uh, half of the half of the surgeons uh, choose um, uh, about half of the surgeons choose uh, decompression alone, and the other half um, um, choose um, picked um, decompression with fusion, um, and uh, uh, maybe surprisingly. Uh, if the if the surgeon choice was similar to the randomization, the results uh, were not better. Were uh, exactly equal. The, resu the results when the when the, uh, the surgeon pick was different to the to the randomization. So uh, the the surgeons was not better than a random pick. I think that was, that, that's very interesting. And um, we presented that at our uh, meeting, at our annual meeting now, and Eva presented it there. And it's, uh, the numbers are interesting that, that you, yeah, the, the, the surgeon's preference was not better than the randomization uh, choice. Um, but in this case, back to this case, number three, um, I would I would uh, recommend it. Uh, I would have recommended um, decompression alone. And if we look into his clinical results, maybe that would have been the better choice. I don't know. At least he's not happy. Uh, ODI got worse. Um, leg pain is the same. Um, back pain has increased two years after surgery. So maybe he was not a good patient for surgery at all. Maybe he has some other issues. I don't know. Maybe the cancer got worse two years after surgery or he has another disease. I don't know. Um, but uh, he, he, he did not improve. Um, I have another case here. Um, this is a male patient as well, 70 years old. Uh, more leg pain and back pain. Um, we see the, the images here. Um, he has a very degenerative L5 as one as well. I don't know. This is not an exclusion criteria in this trial. And um, we see the facet joints, they're hypertrophic and there's some fluid. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Any, anybody who would choose decompression alone anybody would recommend fusion here i'm not sure i can show so you, you you just you just mentioned the randomization and does the, the the same job as me so um, <laughs> I, I remember i remember a, um, a paper from my ex-boss um, who who put um, the, the decision to monkeys in the zoo and the monkeys um, uh, choice was uh, of course uh, like a randomization or the same uh, like uh, experts um, but but i think um, it's um, it is a decompression for me decompression only 
So, Clemens, I'm going to jump in because um, I've got a few strong opinions on this. But um, the um, uh, to me, you know, if you go back to these patients' clinical scores, um, yeah, you know, here the, the thing is the leg pain is greater than back pain, and um, they've got neurogenic cortication. And I suppose what I rely on a lot for for these decisions is um, the response to epidurals, even if it's just the local anaesthetic component and whether that helps them. And if a patient had an epidural injection that got good flow uh, around the area of concern and either foramen or midline and got good short-term relief of their back and leg pain, you know, clinically to me, that's a good indication to do decompression alone. Mm. Now, if a patient has an epidural injection and says, well, all my leg pain went, but my back pain was still disabling for a week. Uh, and you know my back pain, I think, is my main problem. That's a completely different situation, and you might use Facifox to better define that bone scan with specs. But you know, to me, I think response to blocks is a big thing. Um, and on reading the studies, um, you know, both yours and a lot of other people's, it's not really well defined. And I don't know what other people think about that. I know some people think that injections are, are not a good idea, compromise the results of surgery, etc. And I appreciate that too. Yeah. But I think diagnostic blocks can be really helpful in making these decisions, personally. Uh, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I started my training in Germany, and that's where we... Yeah, there were a lot of injections everywhere. Uh, discographies, uh, injections, facet blocks, cervical injections everywhere. So um, my first year as a resident, I was injecting every joint in the, at the spine, I think. So um, um, I, I thought it was useful. And um, then I continued my training in Norway. And I must say, I don't miss it. <laughs> and um, th there, might be, th there might be some um, yeah, advantages in, in, in the diagnostic process. Um, but I think it's, it's more historically in, in Norway that it's not used. And I think it's not reimbursed either in, in the public healthcare system. So we don't get paid for it. So nobody, nobody uses it really. So uh, that might be a reason. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it's not available. So we don't do it. I can do it myself if I want to. Uh, but but it's, not, it's not common. And um, yeah. Uh, but uh, a little comment. Um, we have uh, performed the subgroup, subgroup analysis, and um, the paper is uh, submitted um, these days. And uh, uh, we also thought before that uh, back pain was sh should be um, uh, a terminator for uh, uh, a predictor for better results in the fusion group. But we didn't find that uh, it was it, it was a trend the other way. Uh, of course, uh, a random uh, a random non different non statistical uh, difference. But uh, back pain was not at all um, a predictor for better outcome uh, in the in the fusion group. And um, it it might be that. Uh, at the same way as instability, it's, it's, it's based on a common belief. We know that spinal stenosis per se uh, gives, it gives back pain. And uh, yes, um, but of course, we should maybe have larger, larger uh, trials, high evidence trials to, to get the exact uh, evidence for, for the subgroups. But uh, in this uh, trial, back pain was not the treatment effect modifier. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and now we are um, already a little bit over, over the time. May I ask you, uh, in the decompression group, um, you mentioned that the midline was preserved. Um, did you, because I think several surgeons and you, you published um, 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 an article as well, um, the kind to, of decompression, what technique you are performing, was this different? Was this leading to a different outcome? 
uh, was it unilateral, was undercutting or bilateral? Was there any different in the decompression group um, uh, about the technique of decompression? Uh, we have not uh, studied um, the decompression techniques. Um, uh, this is uh, this is uh, the other Nostan uh, trial, the Nostan uh, spinal stenosis uh, trial, where the three um, uh, uh, decompression technique uh, have been uh, compared, and uh, uh, neither there there were no difference in the in the treatment groups. They followed each other at uh, baseline three months, one, one year and two years. So uh, um, it was nothing there uh, that could uh, say that one treatment was, was, was better than the, other, the others. But not but in I, this... But I, think, uh, but I think in this one here, if we have 120 patients that were operated with decompression alone, and we have maybe two or three different decompression techniques, we will not find any significant difference. Numbers are too small for that. Uh, the, the, the A study with the, uh, the SST, not the DS, the spinal stenosis trial without uh, spinal anesthesis that was published in, uh, in uh, yeah, this year, um, was uh, 460 patients, I think, with three groups. And there were, there were no differences. You can choose whatever decompression you want. So it's um, very, very good information because you, you guys, you with your power of um, evidence with these RCTs, um, these are so, uh, so good, so valuable information. Um, we can't do something bad if we just decompress the spinal stenosis with a listesis, don't we? Or can we do some some mistakes? Um, is there a, sometimes um, something wrong not to fuse uh, a patient like you've shown? Or do we always do it right when we just decompress it, the patient? It's um, based, based on based on these data, uh, we. Uh, we cannot do any, anything wrong, something wrong. Uh, it's, uh, we have no indication uh, saying what patients we should, we should fuse. Of course, we, we know we have a talk about the, ex the excluded patients, so we, we cannot say anything about those. Yeah. But yeah, and I my agree. We, yes. Yeah, so important. And my my last uh, my last question to you is: um, Would you, if you had the chance to do the study again or a kind of the study again, would you like to include a third arm with conservative treatment only, like one non-operative versus decompression only versus decompression and fusion? to see the power of surgery at all. Because you said that the Herkovitz studies, et cetera, um, they were just comparing techniques. Um, and uh, what about the, con the true control group, the conservative treatment? I, I think it uh, would be difficult to include uh, a conservative group in, uh, in this study because I think we, had got, um, uh, uh, it would be difficult to, uh, to, uh, to get the same uh, patients in the conservative group uh, because, uh, uh, yes, I think, you, I, I think a, a, a trial with uh, in surgery versus uh, non-operative should have an uh, should have an, an have another design. Uh, the patient should um, should be told that if you don't uh, uh, being better during a half year, one year, then you will be operated. I think it will be uh, it will be a lot of crossovers uh, in in the in the non surgical group. So with uh, another design. Where the patients were promised to have been operated during, for example, one year, and then we could at least follow them for a year. 
but uh, yes, we should maybe the <laughs> started a new trial, Gemma. But okay. I, I just Thank want you. to mention that we have um, all patients that we have seen uh, that were eligible for inclusion for the trial, but yeah, didn't want it surgery yet, wanted to wait, or uh, they had not that significant pain yet. Um, all these patients are included in an observation study. So um, we are going to present data on that as well. All the patients that showed up um, and, and were referred to us, but, but were not operated or where we didn't see the indication for surgery at that time are in an, an observational cohort. And um, we, we follow them for 10 years and see if they cross over to surgery at a, at a later time point. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Weber. We're now like 70 minutes. Um, I, um, I, I'm so happy that you took the time to present your study and these cases. There's so much to learn. And uh, I, I guess I will send the next invitation very soon. Um, and this is an, really a treasure. Your RCT is a treasure of uh, knowledge, of experience. And we are looking, uh, I'm really jealous because Switzerland is a small country. Um, but you really did a, a wonderful job to um, to set up this RCT and present us our data. It's um, we're very thankful, um, and thank you, Dr. Austerfold. Thank you, Dr. Weber, to take the time. I know it's after midnight in Norway, like like here, and um, uh, I, I um, just say all this session will be is was recorded, and you can watch it on YouTube very soon. Our wonderful fellow um, Amna Hussein is. Uh, creating this YouTube video. And um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Austerfeld, Dr. Weber, and everybody who participated today and listening to you guys from Norway. We were really impressed. Um, and um, next week, <clears throat> I'm not sure who will present next week. Um, <clears throat> I'm just, uh, no, I, I don't know. Uh, you will find on Twitter, um, Dr. Austerfall, Dr. K Dr. Weber, <laughs> thank you very much, and um, I hope see you soon uh, on Twitter and here on uh, the Virtual Global Spine Conference. So goodbye, thank everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. <laughs>